It is crazy to think that the best laptop of our time can get even better, but it's finally here. This right here is the 16 inch Apple M2 Max MacBook Pro, and this is the same setup, but in an M1 Max configuration. And I'm gonna compare them and find out if you should upgrade from an M1 Max MacBook Pro to the M2 M1 Max, or which one you should go with if you're upgrading from an Intel Mac. My goal for this video is that I would be able to help you determine if it is worth it to spend the money on the M2 based MacBook Pro, or save some money and get an M1 model and Instead. Of course, if you do end up purchasing a MacBook Pro or anything mentioned in this video, please consider using the links in the description as they do help support the channel and provide content for you for free. Now, there are many tests and comparisons out there which are super helpful and are amazing, but not all of them get into the nuance I wanted to find out for my personal needs and many who would take advantage of all the power built into these laptops. Even if you're not a power user in the way that I am, you can still glean some helpful information here to make an informed choice with your hard earned money. So here are the tests I'm going to share with you. Keep in mind, a few of these have some more nuance approaches to these tests. A browser test, a data transfer test from an external SSD, a disk speed test, a random read write test, an Adobe Lightroom test, and an Adobe Photoshop test, a Final Cut export test with added motion graphics, a DaVinci Resolve playback and export test with multiple forms of motion graphics and effects, and then a Blender test. Let's start off with the easy test and the one that we can all relate to, the browser test. Right now this is interesting because Chrome takes up a ton of RAM, an M1 Max laptop has 64 gigabytes of RAM, while the M2 laptop has higher RAM options of 96 gigabytes of RAM. So these are both maxed out all the way. Right now they're running a whole bunch of to-do list tests here on speedometer, and we already have a finished completion score of 296 on the M2 Max version. Then over here we have 181 on the M1 Max. So that looks like the M2 Max gets a 63.5% higher score than the M1 Max. That is crazy. Granted, if you're already pushing the limits of your browser tabs on the M1 Max, you have problems like I do, and you need to declare tab bankruptcy. Just do it, just hit the X. You know you need it. You're not gonna read all of them. You're not, you're not. So transferring files is one of the most important and time consuming parts of the creative process. On top of that, on-device storage upgrades from Apple do tend to be quite costly compared to an external drive. So we have a transfer test folder, and each one of these folders is just a little bit over 230 gigabytes. It's 232.21 to be exact. And each one of these drives has a max transfer speed of about 1000 megabytes per second. This is a Samsung T7, and this is the SanDisk Professional G Drive. Plug it in and we'll try it on all these. Let's try it on the same port on this one. So I've actually tested this out a few times, so we're just double checking. And try it again on this red one. And let's try it one more time here. Okay, amongst multiple transfers and tests between them, we get an average time of four minutes and 13 seconds on the M1 Max model, and then five minutes and eight seconds on the M2 Max model, which is very unexpected. That means that the M2 Max is 55 seconds slower. Now keep in mind, that was only a 230 gigabyte transfer. Most of the products that I have will go over one terabyte per project, so that can really compound to quite a bit of time, especially when you're in a crunch. So that would be a big negative for me. Blackmagic disk speed test, a classic. Oh wow, um, there is definitely a big difference in the speed of the M2 Max. So the M2 Max is getting 7,655 megabytes per second, while the M1 Max is getting 6,303 for write. That means that the M2 Max is getting a 21% faster write speed. As for read speed, it's not as dramatic. It's about 11% faster for the M2 Max. So that's interesting. It's performing way better on disk rather than an external drive, but let's make sure. Let's set up this this random read and write test right here. Now, when we look at the test scores here, we can see that they're fairly negligible. In most cases, it's maybe like a one or 2% difference. And in some cases it does go up to 10%, but it's quite infrequent. So I wouldn't necessarily make your decision based upon this random read write score. However, tests from others are showing that the storage options for the M2 models below one terabyte can lead to speeds being 50% slower than the previous model. So that would be a massive negative for me. So the takeaway is that you should get one terabyte of storage minimum. And if you can afford it, I'd suggest going with the maxed out onboard 
lowered storage option. I've often regretted going with lower storage options even at one or two terabytes. It's kind of a pain in the butt using an external drive when you're traveling. It's actually kind of worth the convenience. Now in order to display, transfer, or power your MacBook Pro to the max, you have to get some top tier accessories to go with it like the ones from this video sponsor, Speakin. What's great is that I already use all three of these personally. The first one I want to show to you is their Speakin ArcWire 8K HDMI 2.1 cable. Now this is convenient because the new MacBook Pro supports HDMI 2.1 and there are a lot of HDMI cables out there that do not support the HDMI 2.1 standard and it's 48 gigabits per second transfer speed. And there are a lot of ones that say that they do support it, but they don't actually support it. It's kind of the wild, wild west on Amazon. It's crazy. Well, this one supports 8K 60 hertz and 4K 120 hertz, which is a big deal since Macs now support high refresh rate screens. The Spigen arc wire is helpful because you know exactly what you're getting with it. So many cables out there use the same USB-C port, but not all of them can charge or transfer files as fast as others. This one transfers up to 40 gigabits per second if you have a device that can push that much data. It also supports 8K displays or dual 4K displays and can support up to 100 watts of power. That's a perfect pairing for my favorite accessory from them that I bring with me whenever I travel. The Speakin ArcStation Pro 100 watt GAN charger can charge one of these computers up to 50% in 44 minutes. Because of that GAN technology, it is so much smaller compared to the normal Apple charger and manages to have two USB-C ports so you can charge more than one item at a time. Being able to have two chargers in one and a smaller footprint is huge for me when traveling. If you're interested in any of these, go ahead and click the links in the description. And thanks so much to Speakin for sponsoring this portion of the video. Okay, now we're gonna test out Lightroom. This is kind of crazy. We have 346 raw photos and we're gonna see how fast they export. And go. All right, I'm starting to hear the fans kick up on this one. That's interesting. It actually started on the M2 Max before the M1, which is just now starting. Okay, we have a minute and 28 seconds on the M2 Max and 11 seconds longer on the M1 Max. What's interesting is I did run this test earlier with nothing else open and I was able to get a 52 second export time on the M2 Max with a one minute and 39 second export time on the M1 Max. So the M1 Max would have been 190% longer. But now that I have used it a little bit more, opened up different apps and stuff like that, like a normal person, the difference actually isn't all that different. Interesting. Okay, now we're gonna run a Photoshop Puget Bench system test here. This run through a lot of common tasks that you would see from someone who's a graphic designer. All right, the test is done and it looks like the M2 Max got a overall score of 1,206, while the M1 Max got an overall score of 908. That means that the M2 Max has a 32% higher score than the M1 Max. That's kind of substantial. Now, a lot of creatives use or have used Final Cut Pro, Apple's own video editing software. This should utilize Apple Silicon quite well, or at least it should, but that's another discussion. <laughs> this is Apple's own video editing software. Now, this video file is about 42 minutes long, almost 43 minutes long. Now, in a lot of the tests I've seen, I've noticed that they've missed some use cases that are actually quite common. Typically, they'll use a long clip or a video file with a difficult codec, maybe some color grading, and even some stabilization or noise reduction. What is strangely not included are motion graphics, especially kinds with lots of text. For some crazy reason, text is one of those things that tax video editing programs a lot, or NLEs, and I don't really understand why, but I use a lot of tools like that from companies like Motion VFX for my animated text charts and title slides. Links for those in the description as well. So you can see here that I have these motion graphics with text here and they have their fade ins and outs for the animation. And typically in situations like this, they would just get really stuttery on playback, but it's actually playing it smooth right off the gate on the M2 Max. And surprisingly, the same on the M01 Max. This used to be a terrible experience on Intel Macs. So let's export and see how they perform. So this looks like it will end up being 153 gigabytes for a file. And then we'll hit save and start. Now I've already run this test, but we're gonna try it out just again, just to make sure. All right, the results are in for the M2. We get a export time of four minutes and 51 seconds, and the M1 Max is five minutes and 21 seconds. That's a 30% difference, which is honestly not that bad. It's about 10% of a difference. Now lately, a lot of people are moving over to DaVinci Resolve, me included, and I have no regrets. What I found though, is that it also struggles with some motion graphics, especially ones with text, which is funny because it's more powerful than Final Cut Pro. So I 
I'll typically notice it here at the beginning of these motion graphics. So you can see it's getting really choppy here and then it smooths out. And then when we go to the end parts of it, when it's starting to transition out of a motion graphics text scene, it starts getting stuttery again. Okay, so now we're exporting this at 4K at H.264. Now what's interesting is this bar up here will tell you how many frames per second it's processing or exporting live. So right now we're hitting 91, 92 frames per second and that's consistent on both models. Now what's interesting is once we get to the motion graphics part of the video, the M2 Max will go down to one frame per second while the M1 Max goes down to half a frame per second. Oh yeah, see like we're hitting 20, 19, 20, so they're pretty close actually for this one. Now for the first set of motion graphics, I think there's a greater disparity because I have multiple types of motion graphics stacked on top of each other, while the second one is only just one. So that makes me think that if you are the kind of person that is using a significant number of motion graphics and text all the time, you might actually start noticing some tangible benefits with the M2 over the M1. But let's let this finish and find out for sure. All right, we just finished the DaVinci Resolve export. And we have a completed time of 10 minutes and 26 seconds on the M2 Max one and a 13 minute and 12 second export time on the M1 Max. That's also a two minute and 46 minute difference between the two. And that can really start adding up the more and more motion graphics that you start adding to your projects. We actually don't have as many as I normally use in one of my videos. We only have just like one section of what we would have there. So it might make some sense getting an M2 Max video if you're using a ton of motion graphics in DaVinci Resolve. If you're someone working on 3D modeling and animation, then you're probably familiar with Blender. For this test, we're using the common BMW test to see how they perform. All right, and the results are in for Blender. The M2 Max gets a render time of two minutes and 22 seconds, while the M1 Max gets a render time of two minutes and 57 seconds. So it looks like the M2 Max is 20% faster. For the stuff that you're doing in Blender, this is just an easy image. And I know that you start getting the animations and stuff and that kind of time really starts compounding significantly. So definitely worth the upgrade for the M2 Max. So what are the takeaways? Takeaways. If you use RAM intensive programs like Chrome, just kidding, but not really, then the M2 makes sense simply because it has higher RAM options, but really 64 gigabytes of RAM is fine. So it's honestly not that big of a difference to have that higher tier option, unless you have a use case that you really know will take advantage of that. If transfer speeds are critical for you, go with the M1. As for storage, as long as you have one terabyte of storage or higher, the read and write speeds on the M2 are fine. If you're using Final Cut, the difference between the two isn't that significant. If you're using DaVinci Resolve and you use a lot of motion graphics, and text to the point that it would create a far greater disparity than the three that I used in this test, I can easily see it making sense to go with M2 as time can really start to add up. I was not expecting that result and I don't like hearing that because I don't want to spend the money to upgrade, but... And if you're using Blender for your work, the M2 makes a ton of sense. The time savings are quite dramatic there as well. Now, you have to kind of take this in context of how much all of this costs as well. The full on max out M2 max model is $6,099. Now an M1 max max out model is $5,499. That's $600 of savings. Now, if you go for the option that is not fully maxed out, you can get a 64 gigabyte RAM option with one terabyte of storage for three thousand eight hundred ninety nine dollars or previous generation one for three thousand five hundred ninety nine dollars. So that would end up being a savings of three hundred dollars. And at that point, maybe not the biggest amount of savings because you can't really upgrade your uh, your storage too much, you can get, uh, yeah, you don't really get a lot more storage on that one. So at the lower storage and RAM options, the price difference between the processors isn't actually as much. This is not entirely easy to discern. So thanks for watching. This is Tech Today. Until next time. Bye, Ruby. Bye. Where's your arm? Bye.